technology mapping is the second phase of multi-level logic synthesis. What we did so far is the first phase in which we assumed some simple library. We did not go into the properties of the cells in the library. These arguments were in terms of literals, which are a little higher levels of abstraction. But once you have done those optimizations, there is the need to realize a logical net list that we have come up with in terms of uh, physical cells chosen from a standard cell library or any library. So, that is what the technology mapping uh, consists of. It is also called cell library binding, uh, because these are cells that you choose from an individual library and uh, realize a logical net list in terms of those cells. This is the technology dependent part of logic synthesis. So, what it means is that in the first phase, you pretty much keep the same irrespective of what is the target library, but the second phase is target library dependent. Here too, you could specify different objective functions. It could be minimize area for a given delay or minimize delay for an area constraint and so on. So, there are two inputs. One is the optimized logic network that we came up with, but the other important input here is a cell library, where each cell consists of information that should be useful to us in making that decision. So, the function of that cell has to be captured in some way, so that when we see some um, logical gate, we ought to know whether this cell is suitable for that or not. We can assume for example, that uh, these are simple multiple input cells with a single output, but beyond that various parameters can be included in the cell that helps us uh, in various uh, synthesis decisions. This would include area and propagation delay of various types. It could be that uh, you have one delay and that is some average delay or it could be a maximum delay, it could be a minimum typical worst case. It could also in general of course, be a function. It need not be a number, because the propagation delay through a cell of course, consists of other things beyond that cell itself. Right? Uh, specifically, it is a function of fan out of that cell. A number cannot really be hard coded as the delay of a gate, because there are other dependencies. But uh, those other fan out kind of information, at least partially the load is available to us when we look at the entire net list. So, we could capture the propagation delay in terms of some intrinsic properties of that cell itself, but also some external properties and how the delay depends, whether it is delay or power or whatever the function is, how it depends on the external parameters. Those could also be encoded as a property of those cells. So, that we can take the appropriate decisions when we decide whether or not to use the cell. Our mapping problem can then be find an equivalent network. You start with a network, but you find an equivalent network whose internal nodes ultimately are all cell instances. And some objective function has to be optimized in the process. Let us just quickly illustrate technology mapping with an example. So, what we have here is a typical logic network. So far, we do not know anything about the physical properties. These are just logical gates that are chosen. So, as far as technology mapping is concerned, this is just a specification of the functionality of that circuit. Now, I need to realize that in terms of elements that are chosen from SL library. 
associated with each of those cells, let us just put a cost. This is a simplification of course, the real cost might actually not be a constant for example, it could be a, a, a function. But uh, if I choose an inverter, let us say the cost is 1, if I choose this AND gate followed by R, that cost is 5 uh, and so on. This is an annotation of the cost of each of the individual cells. Our problem in technology mapping would then be find a way of realizing that logic network in terms of elements selected from that cell library in a way that the cost is minimized total cost is minimized. A trivial solution should not be difficult. We can just have each of these elements of the network realized in terms of some combination of cells from the library. That cannot be hard, because these are gates and of course, each individual gate is capable of being implemented with some combination of cells. An AND gate is good enough for us to realize anything, any combinational function. Now, specifically, an OR can be implemented, an AND can be implemented, an inverter can be implemented, everything can be implemented of course. So, the trivial one would be, you just perform that uh, translation locally, take every gate and just find out which is the library element that can realize that gate. If there is more than one, then you just select the one that has lower cost. I could do that, but um, of course, I would like to do this in a way that the cost is minimized. Problem of course, in the trivial mapping is that alternatives may be there. The solution chosen was a local one, which is each individual gate, we chose the component with the lowest cost. But what we skipped is that it is possible to sometimes combine several gates and realize that combination of gates in terms of maybe one cell from the library. Okay. And the costs in the process might be different. It might be different from the sum of the costs of realizing the individual gates in terms of individual library elements. So, it could be that I have this AND OR library element and there is an AND OR structure there in my logic network also. So, I can through a matching process come to the conclusion that at least that part of this circuit could be realizable in terms of something that I can take from the library. And in the process, I come up with a cost, uh, that is the cost that is annotated here. That cost could be smaller than the sum of the costs if each of these gates were to be individually realized in terms of some other components. That is expected of course, somebody has designed an AND OR gate, it means that uh, it is most probably a more area efficient, uh, whatever the cost metric is. If it is area, then it might have been laid out in a way that is more compact than if you uh, lay out discrete uh, structures of those gates and then wire them up. That is an expectation, when there is a manually designed component that is more complex, you can expect that its implementation would be smarter than if you take discrete components and put them together. Okay, so, if I do that, then all these three gates are realized in terms of one component and these gates are still the same. So, my total cost then would be the sum of uh, these costs which is 10. Uh, the original uh, mapping was 15. So, you can see there is some leeway here for an optimization function to work with. Let us try to formalize this idea of technology mapping by taking an example and building up the logic which essentially forms the algorithm for doing technology mapping efficiently.
this discussion is uh, straight from the book, uh, Demichelis book on synthesis and optimization of digital systems. So, take a look at that for more details, but this is the same example that is discussed there and we can take a look here. Just three gates and I have a small library here in terms of whose elements I would like to realize that logic network. Okay. What is non-trivial about this example? It is just that I have multiple choices, that is all. But when there are multiple choices, how to resolve it and how to uh, minimize the total cost is the question. But first of course, I need to make sure I realize some implementation. And then there is the question of doing it in an efficient way, minimizing the cost. So, the first part is let us just make sure that uh, we come up with the right set of uh, matchings or realizations of those uh, gates, so that uh, we are able to at least generate a netlist, generate some netlist. So, here are the set of matchings that we can identify take one of these gates, right, that OR gate and ask the question of which of these cell library elements are suitable for realizing that OR gate V 2. This is good, that OR gate of course, is already there and I can use, but in this example that AND OR is also good, because uh, this part of it is matching our V 2, but as it turns out one of these inputs uh, is the AND of two other inputs, right. One of the inputs to the OR gate is the AND and uh, in fact, we do have such a structure at the input of V 2. Right. So, there are two matchings possible to just cover V 2. It could be that I use that OR 2 gate for V 2, that is one matching. Alternatively, I could select that AND OR 2 gate, which will together cover both V 1 and V 2. So, both of them are possibilities. Each of these we are calling a separate match, that is M 1, M 2 refers to V 2 being matched by that AND OR 2 gate. In fact, the combination of V 1 and V 2, both of these, that is this ellipse, both of these are together matched by one and or two component. We can do this for all the gates that we have. Between them, the optimal solution must lie. So, question of course, is what set I should choose, what subset of those matchings I should choose, because I do not have to choose all of them. If I have chosen M 1, uh, there is no need to also choose M 2. Fine. So, for V 1, what are the choices? There is an AND gate, two input AND gate that is all, I do not have other choices. So, there is a matching M 3 that matches V 1 with AND 2. When I say matching of V 1, what I mean is the output is fixed. These are single output gates, possibly multiple inputs, but single output. So, whatever I choose that at the end must give an output that is the output of the gate I am trying to match. So, that is how I am defining my matches. So, for V 1, there is only one match independently if I were to generate that output of V 1. Similarly, for V 3, I would have two choices. One is I could use OR 2 as I did with V 2, but I could also use that AND OR 2, which would cover both V 1 and V 3. So, these are all my matchings. I can enumerate all the matchings for the gates taken one at a time. Okay. So, I have two matchings for V 2, one for V 1 and two for V 3. When I say for V 3, I just mean the output, realizing the output of that gate. Of course, V 1 is also occurring here and is also occurring so, that is my enumeration of the matches. 
as part of my mapping process, I must have the requirement that all the gates must be covered. So, covering all the vertices or all the gates means that I have to choose some subset of these matchings. All the matchings I have enumerated here, but uh, it would be redundant to use all of them in my actual technology mapping, because there is redundancy among them. How do I identify those redundancies? Covering of V 1 is possible, if I select either M 2 or M 3 or M 5, any one of them is ok, right, because each of them covers V 1. Any one of them I could actually select and realize my V 1. Similarly, covering of V 2 means that I could use either of these two. Covering of V 3 means I could use either of these two. My requirement of course, is that all three sh must be covered. There is one thing to note here, there are some constraints. Some covers might not be good enough given the connectivity that is there in the net list. That can be illustrated by us considering that pair of matches. M 1 referred to V 2 being matched with that OR gate, just the two input OR gate. M 5 referred to V 1 and V 3 together being covered by that AND OR gate. So, between these two they actually cover all the three vertices, but that library element AND OR 2 does not really give us that output of the AND function as an explicit output of the cell. It might not, the designer has designed it in some way, he might give, but uh, might not uh, give particularly if our assumption is that all the elements have one output, then of course, it is not there. We could relax that, but in general it might be there, it might not be there. When you pick up some element from a library, that specific output, internal output that you are looking for might not actually be present. So, if it is not present, then that does not lead to a legal cover, even though all the nodes are actually uh, included. So, I need to somehow take care of that. So, a few other clauses I may need to put in, some clauses I have already identified. These are Boolean clauses that first said any one of these matches must be true, must be selected. But uh, this connectivity is an additional requirement, which uh, we can identify as follows. If M 1 is chosen, right, if I choose this, then the choice of M 3 is implied. Do you see why? I actually have multiple choices, but uh, as it turns out that M 2 is not a choice. In fact, I should, uh, since these two are the inputs that I need. So, for producing the x, I need to choose the appropriate matching. If I were to use M 5, then that x would be hidden. from that. So, I can come up with a new implication that says M 1 implies M 3. Similarly, I can say M 4 the choice of M 4, that OR gate implies M 3. This is a new requirement, set of new requirements that come about from the need to establish connectivity properly in the selected maps. How do you encode that in terms of a Boolean function? The earlier part we know how to encode as a Boolean function, we already did we had these clauses that said M 1 plus M 2 plus M 3, which means that from those three, one of them must be chosen. So, that is fine, 
but uh, this implication how do you capture that as a boolean function are you familiar with this what logic captures the boolean function m1 implies m3 both are boolean values m1 is a boolean value what does it tell you if it is true then first of all are we clear that these m1 m2 m3 m5 all of these are just boolean variables right if it is true it means that you have selected that matching if it is false it means that you have omitted that matching and out of all the matchings that we have enumerated we have to select some subset that subset must cover all the gates but it uh, must also satisfy the connectivity requirements that's my problem so these are boolean variables m1 implies m3 what boolean function is associated with that implication it must correctly capture my requirement we can write out the truth table it must cannot be that difficult sorry so anyway there are only four conditions so we can analyze each one of them to find whether the suggested implication is violated where is it violated where is it holding if it is violated we will call it uh, false, we will call the implication false, right. otherwise it is true. What is there on the output column? Where is it violated? For which combination of M1 and M3 is it violated? The first one is 0. Yeah. Violated means let us just one call zero it uh, 0, if it is not violated everything is fine then we will call it 1. So, which ones would be 0 here? Zero, first one, zero, 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 second, 0, 1, 0, should be First, second, 0. Yes, sir. This, sir, this is 1, 1, of course. M1 implies M3 must mean that if M1 is 1, then M3 must be 1. That is my requirement that is violated by which of these combinations. It cannot be violated by these two, because I do not care about uh, the conditions where m 1 is false. Statement was if m 1 is 1, then m 3 must be 1. So, if m 1 is 0, then it uh, is not even captured by that constraint. It must be that it is true. Yeah, It is not violated, so we will call it fine. Where is it violated actually? It is only here that it is violated this is of course fine that is my truth table and that function is just that. So, if you have m 1 being true and m 2 being false then that is what we do not like. So, the fun implication function is essentially just this yeah. m 1 Right. This is the standard logical function to capture implication. I can do that. So, if I say m 1 implies m 3, then the clause that is inferred from there is m 1 prime plus m 3. If I say m 4 implies m 3, then the clause that is implied from there is m 4 prime. Any questions on this implication? This is uh, this is a standard um, logical function, and its uh, realization would be uh, in terms of such a boolean logic. So then, our overall requirements are just these two. One is that all the vertices must be covered, all the connectivity requirements must be met, and how do we make that happen? We 
derive those implications and those implications lead to other clauses that must also be satisfied in addition to those covering related clauses. So, what do I have? I had these clauses being inferred from the covering requirement, because every gate translated to one clause here. For one of the gates, I could have chosen either M 2 or M 3 or M 5. So, this was that AND gate that I had. Uh, for the other two gates, I had M 1 plus M 2, I had M 4 plus M 5. So, these are my covering requirements these are my connectivity requirements and all of them must be met. This refers to that gate that it corresponds to the gate that it was derived from that clause must be satisfied, which means that either M 2 or M 3 or M 5 must be true. For the second gate M 1 or M 2 must be true, for the third gate M 4 or M 5 must be true all of these three must be true for me to cover all the gates of the net list. Similarly, all of these must be true for me to satisfy all the connectivity implications. And therefore, I take the product of all of those clauses that must be true uh, means that all clauses must be true. That could be a way to capture our logical requirements for a legal covering. This does not capture the cost, this only captures the feasibility, because multiple solutions might be there for this. Then finding a solution refers to what? giving a truth assignment, finding what value for m 1, m 2, m 3, m 4, m 5 first of all results in that equation being satisfied. This is actually nothing but the Boolean satisfiability problem given a Boolean expression. The satisfiability problem is to assign values to the variables such that that expression is satisfied. So, this is what this is. Uh, the cost part of it we still have to get to, but uh, from a uh, feasibility point of view that satisfiability problem needs to be solved. Of course, we have already seen how to solve this. Yeah, if you were to build the ROBDD for that function, then the path from the true node all the way to the top gives us a set of assignments that uh, will lead to that function being satisfied. So, that is the overall idea. So, couple of things here, one is we have to enumerate those matches, right. I informally pointed out that you take one of those gates and uh, two of the library elements could match that gate or three of the library elements could match that gate. We somehow have to formalize that a little bit, that is the first part. Uh, that in fact is the easier part, because not that many elements will match. Uh, libraries would have tens or hundreds of elements and some subset of them will match. Uh, it cannot be too hard to find that matching, but in general that matching could be structural, which means that I could just check for an isomorphism. If both of these were represented as graphs, both my net list is represented as a graph and those library elements are also represented as uh, small graphs. Some of them are just single node uh, graphs, but otherwise uh, they are uh, two or three or such a small number of uh, nodes. Then what we are looking for could be a check for isomorphism. Even though the general graph isomorphism is an intractable problem, the uh, kind of isomorphism we are talking about here, where one of those patterns is actually very small might not be too expensive. But even then, the matching could be better if you assume that the structure that you have is a tree rather than a general graph. We will make that assumption, even though the general net list is not a tree, it is uh, of course, uh, there is a combinational function and uh, the DAG is what is the standard structure representing that net list. 
it turns out that many of these uh, algorithms are difficult if you want to solve them optimally, um, assuming it is a DAG. But if you assume that it is a tree, then efficient solutions are there. So, one standard heuristic could be you take that DAG and just cut some of the edges of the DAG and make it a tree artificially, even though it was not a tree originally. Uh, you make it in a way that other things would still be satisfied, but, um, um, but then you can run your algo matching and uh, mapping algorithms by assuming that they are tree or you divide a graph into multiple trees and uh, apply the optimization algorithm on the individual trees. That is the approach that is taken here. The other thing to note here is that structural matching is not the only kind of matching that is involved. The more general matching is what is called a Boolean matching, where you have some function here that in general could match some other function like that. Maybe this is there in the library and that one is not there. This is there in your logic network and you are trying to find out elements from the library that are matching and in fact, this element is there. But uh, establishing that these two are equivalent is a different problem though, because structurally they are not equivalent. I have a prime b prime plus b prime c plus a b. I have a prime b prime plus a c plus a b. Turns out that both are equivalent. If you draw the truth table, you will see that they are equivalent, but it is not immediately obvious. Of course, you can build the BDDs for each of them and then trivially establish that it is equal, but then that does bring construction of the BDD into the picture uh, here. Uh, so, this is in general the more accurate thing to do, the Boolean matching but often we do not do this because it might be expensive. We can do with just structural matching here and give up some optimality in the process. Okay. So, I would like to perform this covering and we could do some initial pre-processing just to make the algorithm simple. Let us do a decomposition of that logic network into just NANDs. Remember, it is just a specification of the functionality so far, what is there in that logic network, which we want to realize in terms of the cell library gates. That is just the functionality. You could restructure it in whatever way you want as long as it is equivalent. So, specifically, I can convert it into just two input NANDs. It is always possible. And if there are inverters, then it is fine. It is a special case of the NAND gate, of course. But that will help us, uh, since we are relying on structural matching, it will actually help us in performing this structural matching, because it is simpler. You could generalize that to other kinds of gates also, but uh, the basic strategy could be illustrated um, using just this. So, you take whatever the network that was given and decompose it into NAND gates, just two input NAND gates. Okay. The other preprocessing I might want to do is a partitioning of an original multi output network into multiple single output networks. What is happening here? So, suppose you have some logic like that and some other logic like that. These are the inputs and those are the outputs. the matching and covering process, we want them to be trees. So, these uh, multiple outputs unfortunately, might have be overlapping in terms of the logic that is there, but you can divide that into multiple graphs that might uh, be independently, it might be considered trees for us to just to simplify the covering process later on. So, how do you divide this? That could be one tree, this could be one tree and that part here could be 
a tree. Now, it is possible that there are multiple outputs. So, from here there is a single output, from here there is a single output, but this one I have to see how many outputs are there. It is possible that there are multiple outputs between that, right. If that is the case, then I can split that further. So, in general, the kind of structure that we want to cover is this. I have one output and I have a bunch of inputs and this is a tree structure that I have. There are some nice properties of these algorithms that work on trees. We can guarantee optimality in terms of the covering. So, where optimality is broken is in the process of dividing that DAG into trees and that is hard to do. There may be many choices, which one is the best is not clear, but uh, a tree itself can be covered in an efficient way. Okay, so, these are what we are calling subject graphs that need to be covered. Once you have made this partition, each of these problems is independently solved. You take each, each of those trees and uh, do the covering yourself. They are anyway not overlapping here in the logic, so you realize them in terms of different uh, gates. What it also means is that if there was some logic from one tree that could have been shared with some logic of the other tree in uh, terms of an efficient uh, realization of gates, that you are giving up in the process of doing this partitioning into trees. But there is some efficiency that results. One is that individual algorithms are efficient, but also the tree is smaller. This is a bunch of smaller trees. Therefore, uh, you can expect that those algorithms will converge fast. All right. So, we have a subject graph and a pattern graph. The subject graph comes from the network that we want to cover. Where does the pattern graph come from? from the cell library. This is the graph that corresponds to an individual cell. So, the purpose of the matching process is to find whether the particular cell under consideration can be used or not. Does it match that node of the subject graph or not? That is the question. So, the way we represent this is, now there are two kinds of nodes under consideration here. Remember, we broke the everything down into NAND gates and inverters maybe. So, these are NAND gates, all of these are NAND gates and these brown nodes are inverter. Right. Then, these are the leaf nodes. We just put these dummy nodes in um, to help us in the algorithm. But in the subject graph that would correspond to the primary inputs of the combinational logic that we are trying to cover. In the pattern graph, it just means that this is a partial covering right? and whatever corresponds to those leaves, you may now have further um, cell library elements that would match there. Right? So, that is what I have three kinds of nodes. One is the two input nodes, other is a single input node and the third one is a leaf node. That is all that I have. And there is only one kind of node, remember there is only NAND gate, so they are all actually equivalent. Orange node is a two input NAND gate. There is nothing more complex in terms of the functionality. So, how do I go about matching? Suppose I am at a particular node u and a node v, node u from the pattern graph and node v from the subject graph. I am trying to establish whether the matching is ok or not. So, we start off with the simpler cases saying if u is a leaf, then it is ok. Why is it ok? Uh, there is a traversal that is happening, this is implies a recursive kind of a process. I might end up at the leaf. I start off with the roots of both the structures, but I might end up uh, uh, somewhere and uh, the leaf tells us essentially the termination condition for the matching. We are saying that if we reach the leaf of the pattern node, then everything is fine. Why is everything fine? 
if I am trying to match u with v, it means that the v itself can then be matched by some other library element perhaps, but uh, so far everything is fine. Uh, if I reach the leaf, it means that for example, both of these have been correctly matched. That is how I land up with the uh, leaf of the pattern graph. So, it must be okay, this is a, a termination condition for the recursion. Okay. What if v is a leaf? That is u an internal node and v from the subject graph is a leaf. This is not okay. Why? So, you have some other nodes. Yeah, u is an inverter there for example, that is an inverter here, but I do not have a need for that inverter, v is already at the primary input for the subject graph. So, there is nothing to do, I have come down the wrong path here. So, matching will not occur anymore if I reach the leaf of the subject graph and while I am still there at the uh, internal node of the pattern graph. Of course, if both of them are leaves, then what happens? then it is fine. Have we covered that? Not yet. Sure. Look at that algorithm. Yeah, if u is a leaf it means that irrespective of whether v is a leaf or not, we have already covered that. So, what uh, condition is left? Of course, the interesting thing is still left, the real matching is still left, which is both are internal nodes. So, how do we proceed? If both are internal nodes, then? the functionality is limited, they are only inverters or NAND gates. So, it cannot be that hard, oh, what do we do? So, I am somewhere here and I am somewhere here, it does not matter where, perhaps I am here and I am trying to check whether the matching should proceed further or not. How do I go about it? If they are matched then we go to their childs and call them. If they are matched means? Compare the number of uh, Nodes which are of rooted subtree. If I compare that, number of nodes. No, it just compare under the function. That. Yes, because so okay, because that will. So we had a case when v is not a leaf. That's an internal leaf. Yeah. We return the false, right? So if number of nodes are not matching in the two. Hmm. But I, if number of nodes are no, you expect the number as you start from the root, you expect a mismatch. This is a small thing, remember the pattern is small, the subject graph is large. So, the matching is ok if it is partial, it is just that is it legal or not. For example, it matches just this much, that is fine right, this part of the subject graph is going to be matched by that cell. Then I continue the matching with uh, maybe I find some other match here, maybe I find some other match there. That is fine. We just want to know whether there is a match at the root of that graph or wherever I am in my traversal, is there a match that is rooted at that node? That is what we are looking for. So, in the process I landed up here say and I landed up here and so that is my u, that is my v and I want to know whether these two match or not. These two means that is the start of the match, right? Then there is a subtree under them that I have to continue the matching. Uh, how do I go about this? First of all, I can compare these two nodes. What will it tell us? Uh, what kind of comparison I can do? Yeah, there are only two kinds of nodes. So, what are the possibilities? Both can be inverters. In which case, what can I do? What can I say about the matching if both are inverters? They are matching. We can recurse further to their children because at this level it is okay. So, I just call match down further into the next, the child node, that is fine. What other things can happen? Both might not be inverters, both might be NAND, NAND gates, then what do I do? Then it is fine. fine. So, but specifically what can I do? So, that is my subject and that is my pattern. So, I discovered that both are two input nodes, which means that this is fine. So, what do I have? Now, I have a subtree here, subtree here. 
I have a subtree here, I have a subtree here. How do I continue the match? These are both matching, this is just a structural match. It then, match into right, I just continue the match for these two, so these two nodes. So, continue the matching means that if uh, a false value is returned, it should be propagated all the way back, right. So, that is what. So, these two can be matched similarly. Start only if left has not matched, I will start. Right. If the left has not matched, I must abandon the match and uh, just return false to the parent. Right. right. Anything else? The sum property of the NAND function that I can use to do this a little more extensively. Left is matched against left and right is matched against right. But what is the significance of left and right? This is a commutative function, right. Therefore, I must also check these two, right. I must check these two. Who knows, maybe those two if they match, then it is fine, right. So, that is what I should be doing. If they are not fine, if they are not matching, you can terminate the match at an appropriate time, of course. What if I have an, an inverter on one side and a NAND gate on the other side? Uh, there is a pattern node and a subject node, right, uh, u and v. So, if uh, one is an inverter, the other is an NAND. We terminate right then and there. Yeah, we terminate right there, it is false. So, that is all that my algorithm has. These are the terminating conditions. Okay, so, what we are checking here, one is if v is a leaf, then I return false. One is if u is a leaf, I return true. If the degrees are not equal, then I return false that is also the other simple case. If the degree is 1, both are inverters, then you just match their respective yeah, children. One. Otherwise, because of the commutativity property, you can match left with left and right with right or left with right and right with right. That is all that you need to do. This is an algorithm that looks expensive because of all these recursions, but um, in practice it might not be just because the pattern graphs might not be too complicated. These are just individual cells in a library, right. So, uh, the algorithm is general, but uh, it may turn out that uh, it, most of the time we are terminating pretty fast actually. Okay, that is matching. Then there is the question of covering. The matching actually is the easier part and this has not much to do. Yeah. The covering is something that can be efficiently solved by a strategy called dynamic programming. Are you familiar with this? Okay. It does not matter. So, we will <laughs> try to develop the argument from scratch. This refers to algorithms applied to problems that have a particular property called an optimal substructure. Means that if optimal solution to all descendants, now this is a descendant referring to a search um, strategy in general, but uh, in descendant uh, what it means in our case also should be clear. There is a tree kind of a structure, so there is a parent child relationship, descendant can be defined in those terms. If the optimal solution is known to all the descendants of a node, then that optimal solution to that node can be efficiently calculated. That is the property, it is not always true, for all problems it is not necessarily true, but for this tree covering problem this property holds. Let us see why it should hold. That is my tree, right. So, in general that tree of course, can be large and such a structure is there. So, what this implies in terms of strategies, we could do a bottom up traversal of the subject graph. This is my 
subject graph. We are trying to cover it up with patterns. Our strategy could be for each of the nodes, we list all the matches. This we have already seen how to list. Essentially, I will run match for all the cell library elements. And the cost that I choose for that node referring to the cost of covering the subtree. You see why this tree assumption was needed here. This argument does not hold if it is a DAG in general, right. but for a tree it is fine. The idea of a subtree makes sense only in a tree. If uh, it turns out that there is an overlap between that part and some other part of the structure, then all of this argument does not hold. So, I find the cost here for that subtree, irrespective of what is there in the rest of the tree. So, my argument in terms of this optimal substructure is, if I have annotated the cost, let us say I annotated costs 1, 2, 5, 4, 10, 3, 2, 6, 15, something like that. Each of these costs refers to the cost of covering that subtree that is rooted at that node, total cost of covering in a way that is optimally computed. If that optimal cost were somehow computed, how it is computed we will have to see. But uh, if I knew the optimal costs of covering all the descendants, optimal solution to all the descendants of a node, then the optimal solution here can be efficiently calculated. That property, let us argue that it holds for our problem. What is the argument? Here our cost is, each of those gates is associated with a cost. Each matching is associated with a cost, but of course, there are multiple matchings that are possible. So, at this level, there are multiple matches that are possible. Across all those matches, I should be able to efficiently compute the total cost and so that I can choose the optimal cost for each of them, the minimum one I would choose. How do I do that? Assuming that all of this is known that we have to establish, but if they were all known, then it cannot be a hard problem, the optimal tree covering problem, because there are a limited number of matches. How many matches are there, worst case? for a given node. When I say match, we are taking one node there and we are saying does it match a particular cell library. If there are n cells in the library, then a maximum of n such matches have to be done. Right? Some of them will come out to be true, some will come out to be false. So, those that are false, of course, they can be thrown out. There is no need to look at them further, but uh, maximum of n of them will be true. So, if I know that uh, some out of them, um, max of n of course, I know that, but uh, some m out of them will be true. Those are the ones that I should choose for optimal, for computation of the optimal cover. How do I do that? So, let us say five such cases are there. For each of them, I can, I know where it matched, right. So, one of them maybe was just a match of that one node, other one maybe was a match of these two nodes. A third one could be a match of these three. So, let us say those are my three matchings m 1, that is a second matching and that is a third match. All of them are okay, uh, they are successful matches. Then what could be my optimal covering strategy? Compute the cost. Yeah, compute the cost. How do I compute the cost? I just compute the cost for M 1 matching, cost for the M 2 matching, cost for the M 3 matching and the best one of them is actually optimal. So, let us argue what is the cost for M 1 matching. M 1 matching I am selecting that node, which means, so what would be the total cost of selecting that node at this level? It would be, uh, let me give some names here call it A, B, C, D, 
and so on. That would be the cost of selecting m 1 just that would be the cost of a just that single match which is okay that is just the cost of that uh, node plus let me call this as instead of c let me just call it d we call it x <laughs> this is actually the cost here is what i want to calculate that is the subtree rooted at uh, uh, at that node so that's what this is plus x c that's my total cost that's how i'm counting costs right at the point is that it is valid to count costs in this way. In some other problems it might not be valid to count the cost in that way, but that is all. If I were to choose the m 1 match, my total cost at the root of that tree would be this. I can do this for the others. If I were to use m 2, then Yeah, I have to first take that pattern. That pattern has a cost that is associated with it. Let me call it C1, just implying that it is the cost of the first match, whatever that cost is. Uh, here it turns out to be one node, but in the second case, it is actually two nodes. So, uh, well, anyway, it is one cell library element, whatever it is, that is the cost of that library element, single library element plus whatever is left out. So, this part of it is left out and that part of it is left out. You are right, that is also left out. We'll call it f and I would just say this is let us see 2 plus x of d x of f plus x of this is this is a c that is what it is right. Similarly, I can say the cost of using that m 3 would be whatever is the cost of that library element corresponding to m 3 plus right. So, that, that and that. that is my cost computation and whichever is the minimum out of these, I will just annotate as the optimum cost here. This is a guarantee of optimality. Okay. Of course, it was assuming that my computation of all these subtree nodes are also uh, optimally computed, but uh, that is not hard to establish. right? So, I start from the leaf at the leaf there is no cost and from the leaf level to the next level as I go upwards, I can always apply this um, algorithm and uh, make sure that wherever I am as long as I have the costs computed, optimal costs computed for the children, I am able to cost to compute the optimal cost for the parent. So, here we have addressed how we can optimally kind of calculate the cost of all the various options available to us. But uh, while running this algorithm, do you also so? For example, here this is simple. We have only three matching. Right? Yeah. We can have a very big graph, and these matchings can be huge. So for single yeah. match, we said we can have at the up to n, 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 uh, n. right up to n matches could be there, for a single where n is the number of cells in library. And this is for single node. That is for single node, yes. right. Now, there can first is there are large number of nodes in the graph. Yeah. Is, so, let us say there are m nodes in the in the subject graph. And when we are matching, we are considering the permutation and combination of m as well. So, first and then 2 and then 3 may be the yeah. covered. So, this in itself is a huge problem to optimize. How ah, do we get what we just argued at the time of the matching is that the matching is a relatively, you expect it to be relatively simple task, because the nodes of a library typically are not very complicated. Logic nodes, what kind of logic 
is there in a library that is complex. Maybe there is an XOR, maybe there is an AND or it is still a few gates, it is not very large. The logic nodes are not very large. You could have adders and so on that are treated differently that would not be subject to this kind of optimization. But uh, the stand typical standard cell or gate array uh, cell libraries are not very complex. We did say that the match algorithm you have to be careful about. You take some graph and try to match it with some other graph, it is hopeless. Of course, it be can become exponential easily. But uh, the number, the subject graph can be very large, m can be very large, but the pattern graph you do not expect to be large. Therefore, uh, you expect that matching process to terminate fast. So, the number of matches on the cell level, the probability is very less that we will get a large number. Yes, even though this n is a worst case, n could be hundreds, but the number of such matches that too you do not expect a, a very large number. Those things actually help us curtail this. This algorithm itself is efficient, this is an optimal algorithm considering what the assumptions have been made. Uh, the crucial assumption is that I have a tree structure, how you get that tree structure is a an open problem. You can get some tree structure, but uh, establishing that this is the best tree structure is not easy. Yeah, and validating it is uh, correct after cutting. So, validating it is correct is not an issue. Validating that that is the best way of cutting is the issue. You can cut it any way you want. If you find there are multiple outputs, cut it further. So, it is ok, that process is not uh, difficult, this, you can get a valid cut. The problem is uh, to choose the best cut. Sir, in this uh, tree matching scheme, um, although we are converting everything to MAND and inverters, yeah. can we have some other early termination condition so that maybe we need not enter match itself, because when we convert things into MAND and inverters, the complex cells. Hmm. At least you would have to go down two, three levels to conclude that it does not match to certain nodes in the graph. Right. So, because that, that will have a reasonable, for example, we may have cells of six inputs or seven inputs, these are there. Yeah, yeah. In that case, matching is still possible. Hmm. So, can we add some early termination conditions itself? Let's say you could. Remember, we left out that Boolean matching. We said that it is a complicated, but uh, in fact that is the direction, you could be a little smarter. The structural matching is a little dumb in that sense, you could make that uh, matching a little more sophisticated. Yeah. Okay, we actually worked out everything, so you we hopefully <laughs> do not need. Uh, the further analysis. The examples of course is fine, these two costs are different for reasons that you know understand perfectly. And the tree covering algorithm could then look like something that you can easily fill up now. <laughs> we can leave this open if it helps, I am not sure, but uh, here is a template for this. <laughs> a variation of it we could fill in the exam. So, let me have some costs. Initially, perhaps I can give them a negative cost or something just to indicate that the costs have not yet been computed. Okay? And at the leaves, I indicate a cost of 0. Uh, uh, leaves of the subject graph it is ok, right, because you did not need nothing to match. While some nodes are still there with a negative cost, let me select some node whose children all have cost greater than or equal to 0. What is the meaning of this? The first level um, just above the leaves we are selecting that so it is. Just that? Why? But this is a loop that is uh, going over all the nodes. Cost greater than or equal to 0 is checking what? From the initialization, either the cost has, been computed or has it been computed? Or it is zero. That is all. Right. So, in both the cases, you can proceed. If it is not done, then it is more complex, but if it is done, uh, among other things, if all the children you have computed the costs, then there is enough information for us to 
go ahead. Right. So, if that is the case, then M v could be the set of all the matching pattern graphs at v, right? that is what we had enumerated. My cost computation here is just one line, that is what we did in the 10 minutes that we looked at that example. We are saying find the minimum among all the matches, right? selecting one match at a time m of the following cost of m itself, cost of that cell corresponding to m itself plus the sum of all the sub trees that are rooted at the children L of m is just the vertices of the subgraph corresponding to leaves of m. When you select m, there will be some bunch of uh, sub trees that uh, you now have to account for. Right? So, those sub trees costs you would have to add, that is exactly what we were doing when we said uh, you have C 1 plus X 1 plus X B plus X C and so on. Here this is essentially the cost of M, M right for that M and these are the other cost right. So, the leaf uh, matching costs. You see why there is the requirement that at uh, each node we are annotating the cost of the entire subtree rooted at that node. Right? It is because I may come back to it later. I may choose some match here which uh, matches all of this. If I do that, then I need the that cost, that cost and that cost. Essentially, I need the optimal costs for every descendant um, in order for this algorithm to pick up all the right nodes. I do not know actually when I start off how many matches will be there and what is the complexity of the cells. Maybe it actually covers 10 of these nodes. Then there will be a large number of leaves. I need to know the optimal cost at all of uh, those leaves. So, that is the reason for maintaining the total cost <laughs> at each of the nodes. It corresponds to the subtree that is rooted at that node. Well, the point is once you do that computation, any node under it is also something for which you know the optimal costs.